All right, y'all, we're almost done with lesson two on phenomenology of this religious quest of creation, creativity, and recreation. Just to kind of re recap and wrap everything together and kind of draw connections. You know, a lot of times people think, a lot of times my students brush over the conclusion, right, or the end part, but don't do that with my course because I always put my best stuff in here. Sometimes I give you some new nuggets of information, but it's also about, I don't know, I do this a lot. You'll see me do that a lot, I do that a lot. But it's kind of like pulling everything together, right? Like taking all the different sides of these, all these different perspectives and trying to wrap our arms around them and try to see the connections between them and how things link together. For example, we began this lesson with OM, same as last lesson, OM, that primordial syllable, which we will keep coming back to, don't worry. Uh, say more about that later. And then the asato ma sad gamaya tamaso ma jyotir gamaya amritam amrit gamaya mantra from the Brihadaranyika Upanishad that from non-being take me to being, from darkness lead me into the light, and from death lead me into the fullness of being. I also gave you some, you know, in the notes, I gave you some songs to suggest to listen to. If we were in the classroom, I would play these in the classroom, but I can't play these on videos, ironically, even though there's video, it's easier to play them on videos, but then I run into copyright issues and things. This song by Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds performed for the first time at Radio City Music Hall in, I think, 2006, but called Ehi, and he tells the story. When he first performed it, he told the story on stage of when he went to this tribe in Africa, he's South African himself, when he went to this tribe uh, and spent some time with them and they were singing these songs and he was singing he, this song that I assigned to listen to, or I recommended you listen to, was inspired by those songs that he heard uh, sung by the Khoisan people in Africa. And you know, he asked them at one point, what do these songs mean? And he, he asked one person, they, what does the song mean? And they gave him one answer. And somebody else, they gave a completely different answer. And he asked somebody else, and they gave you a completely different answer. And he's like, what's the deal? Why does everybody tell me that this one same song means totally different things? And then one of the elders, one of the wise elders explained to him, well, these songs, we've been singing these songs since before there were words. It's just fucking crazy, you know that it is. We've been singing these songs since before there were words. And as I hear that, we've been singing these words, but since before, we've been singing these songs since before there were words. We, right? Think about that we. That particular we extends before the word we, right? That we. We have been singing these songs. We have been uttering these songs. The songs that we are singing now, we're just echoing from the past, right? Echoing those voices long past that, but those voices still live through us, through our voices. They're recreated in and through us. One of the things I said in the phenomenological method is the phenomenological method never ends, right? Particularly if we extend it to the past. If we don't just think about our neighbors spatially and not just the expert as those people who teach rich kids at fancy universities right now, but also those experts that lived thousands of years ago, right? That ex those experts that lived before words, who sang these songs before there were words, who sang those songs that are as old as Om, that primordial sound that is even before any sounds and yet, before any words, and yet contains the all the vowels, all the necessary for making any words. As disconnected as that might seem, we then went to Edmund Husserl and the uh, introduction to phenomenology. Of course, I gave you a first introduction of phenomenology in the first lecture. Guess what? We're not done with it yet, but I ran you through the steps. So step zero is to draw a circle because zero is my favorite circle. We'll come back to that zero in a future next time. Step one, identify your perspectival starting point. Where are you coming from? And this is a way to help us discover our presuppositions, uncover our prejudices, uncover our expectations, and to do what Husserl says to epoche or bracket out those things. Kind of like 
put them on hiatus, right? Just put them on the side so that we can focus on whatever this thing is, kind of divorced as best as we can from our experience, which of course is impossible. We'll come back to that later. But nevertheless, because we can't divorce our subjective experience of that objective phenomenon, then we need a multiplicity of perspectives, right? To try and see this thing from as many different perspectives as possible, which is why we need to begin uh, after our perspectival starting point, the next step is to identify that phenomenon that we're studying, right? So what is religion or what is theology? That's our ne next topics to cover. But before we can even get to that, we need to begin to question our own motivations for doing that, which is why we turned then to this question of why study religion. And we began to listen to the experts and listen to our neighbors who have insights to tell us about why we should study religious traditions, why we should study their beliefs. What do they believe and how do they, what sort of lessons do they have to pass on to us? What ability can we gain to stand in someone else's shoes and to, in, the, in Wilford Cantwell Smith's words, right? Not to study something called Buddhism, but to see the world, to see the universe insofar as we can through the eyes of a Buddhist or through the eyes of a Hindu or through the eyes of a Muslim or um, Khoisan, right? I also asked you to watch this TED Talk given by Margaret Heffernan. And uh, she's given a number of TED Talks. Uh, I would recommend them as well. But this one really just fit in and inspired, in fact, a number of the insights that I've given you in this course. One, of course, is that great story that she begins with talking about super chickens, right? And the super chicken flock and breeding chickens um, who produce the most eggs in order to produce the highest gross or the highest yielding crop of chickens, eggs, egg chickens, chicken, 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 chickens, eggs, egg chickens, right? Highest yielding crop of chickens, but they wound up destroying each other, right? Tearing each other apart because what they lacked was the mortar, the social cohesion, the social order that comes from that balance of diversity, a diversity of a team, right? Uh, a lot of her other TED Talks, she talks a lot about teamwork and the importance of play, how we need to, how we can learn to learn from one, one another, right? That's one of her insights. So we, it's not just enough to say we need a diverse team, but we also have to learn how to learn from one another, how to listen to one another. These are skills that have to be built. And so that's part of what, uh, particularly your podcast assignments and these discussions with throughout this course and the phenomenological method, it's all designed to help you learn to learn from one another in and through play or recreation, which again, we'll come back to later. And one of the things that Heffernan mentions in that TED talk was that um, the mortar, not just the bricks matter, right? We need the bricks, of course, to build a, a building, but we also need the mortar. Without the mortar, the bricks, right? We're missing that glue that kind of sticks everything together. So you don't always just want the strongest members on the team, however you might dis define that, but also that social cohesion, those water cooler moments, right? Those times that, um, that build social cohesion. And as she said, right, in a capitalist society, she is a capitalist, within a capitalist society and organization, we need to recognize that social capital, as she puts it, social capital compounds even as it's being spent, right? It compounds and increases because it is being spent. That's how social capital works. And I would add to that, likewise, intellectual capital, right? Intellectual capital compounds and builds and even multiplies as it is spent, right? As we spread our knowledge and spread our wisdom and share our insights with one another, then our understanding of the world, our understanding of phenomenon flourishes. Another insight though that she gave that fits so well with this course is that she said something like, as an idea emerges, it does so, it doesn't come out fully formed, right? This idea doesn't just pop out of our head fully formed, but it emerges in a way that's kind of like a child going through birth, right? And like, uh, like childbirth, it's something messy and confusing, right? And so 
ideas begin in a similar way. They just kind of come out half-formed and confusing and messy. And those ideas, one thing that she didn't um, say that I would quickly add, and in fact this is comes from Socrates. I mentioned Socrates a lot because he was wicked smart. More on Socrates later. But as Socrates says, right, the uh, for an idea to be born, it's born from these two different minds. You need the seed, but you also need the soil. And it's from that discourse, that conversation, those back and forth conversations between individuals, right? This person saying to this person, I see a one. This person saying to this person, I see a five. This person to this person saying, I see a three. And then they begin to, right? Um, to sort of angle in or hone in on this phenomenon that they're studying because they understand where each one is coming from. And if they were to have more perspectives, right, then they would, then their social cohesion, their intellectual capital would increase even as it's being spent, even as they're sharing that information with one another. And because they're sharing it with one another, and through that discourse of differing ideas, you get the birth of new ideas, right? A flourishing of ideas. So that is it, except for the extensive amount of editing that I have to do to kind of pull all this stuff together. But that's my problem, not yours, right? But the last thing I have to recommend is another music. My background is in music. Um, one of my f absolute favorites one of my absolute favorite pieces of music of all time is Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. I think I may talk about it again at some later point, but for now, I would encourage you, it would be a nice way to sort of round off this lesson uh, on phenomenology and introduce some, um, sort of foreshadow so much of what we have ahead. It begins with this a bassoon in an extraordinarily high register playing this lovely little tune. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. And that's, um, but that, listen, if you only listen to the first one minute of it, or 30 seconds of it, um, just the very beginning of it, of that bassoon, just kind of starting from a little whisper and then growing. Stravinsky referred to that, uh, and I think it's even in, written in the score, as the moaning of the earth as the at the dawn of creation. Right? The moaning of the earth at the dawn of creation. Right? That think about in the morning when you wake up and you yawn and you moan. Again, those primordial sounds, those sounds that are so primal that they, uh, they communicate without words. That moaning, that moaning, that unapoetic moaning, which is its, which says what it is, right? But that moaning at the dawn, not just of the morning, but of the, the earth moaning at the moment, at the dawn of creation. So I hope you enjoyed this uh, lesson on phenomenology. I hope that most of it made sense. I know that I threw a lot of stuff in there that uh, that's not all going to make sense yet or that will build, right? Like I said, every layer adds another layer of complexity, another layer of depth. And I want you to get each layer, right? Like peeling an onion. I want you to get each layer. It's not really like peeling an onion because we're like building an onion, right? Layer by layer, building it bigger and bigger until we see a fuller picture. But I'm um, starting as simply as possible with the phenomenological method so that we can use these tools and skills to further our study and our religious quest. Thank you very much for staying with me. Namaste. Namaste.